I'm Bob Baker uh, with Jazz Guitar Today, and we're here today with Kurt Mangan of Kurt Mangan Strings. And I'm going to confess right off the top, I've never used your strings. Okay. But Ted Ludwig is a big fan of yours, and I'm a big fan of Ted's. And um, so maybe you'll send me a set of free strings. What can I tell you? I'm <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be arranged. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. But um, but I did want to talk to you. I wanted to shine some light on, on you. You're out there in, in Colorado. Here in Cortez, uh, kind of close to right next door to Mesa Verde National Park here in the Four Corners area. Yeah. So how did a nice guy like you get in the string business? Started playing guitar when I was... Uh, 10 years old, so I can safely say that I've been playing guitar a lot longer than I have been. So, and that's kind of it, you know, uh, that was 1962, 64 was uh, uh, when the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan, and that was a uh, life-changing event. Yeah, and, um, me too. You know, yeah, so I was already starting to uh, play professionally at when I was 13, and then when I was... Uh, <laughs> 14, I was playing with a, a band out of Loveland, Colorado called um, Us. And uh, we were playing, uh, they were all 18 and, and uh, we were playing, um, you know, all the sock hops and frat parties and in Colorado back then they had what was called uh, three two bars for all the college kids. And um, so my dad used to have to go and chaperone me in all the three two places and all the places like that. but. You know, we were, we were, you know, we got, I got spoiled pretty early because, you know, I was making, you know, 50, 100 bucks a week playing in eighth grade. And um, so, uh, you know, I continued to just try to get better and better and, uh, you know, kept playing. And then at one point, uh, you know, always following a, um, a musical career, but I also had a, the opportunity to gain a um, retail music uh, education and learn that. So that was always a, a good thing to do in between bands was to make money. <laughs> and um, so I did that up until, um, you know, pursuing a music career and recording and had a very uh, stint with 20th Century Fox when I was about 26. And and learned a lot about how major record deals work and decided that well, I think I'll just work on writing songs. And so that's what I continued to do was write songs and uh, work in retail music. And then eventually uh, I got out of retail music and went and started writing jingles for a, for a fairly big music house in San Diego, which was a great experience. And then that's changed. And uh, rather than moving to Los Angeles where I had a job offer um, at one of the music houses up there, I went ahead and moved up to the Central Coast area and um, was still planning on a music career and uh, started working, uh, saw the Ernie Ball needed a customer service representative. And I said, well, maybe I can do that. And uh, so that worked out pretty well for about 17 years. And uh, extremely well, it was a great time. And uh, then, you know, as I got to a certain age, I, I felt like it was probably time for, uh, for me to move on. And um, then circumstances happened where all of a sudden I thought, well, you know, a small little string company you know, might make me a, a decent living. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, I went ahead and, and uh, shifted, shifted from sales and marketing hat to uh, how do you build these things and surrounded myself with some um, pretty knowledgeable people. And uh, you know, we uh, went ahead and built a factory and moved here to Cortez, Colorado, and we're starting our 18th year in it. Well, thank you for, for doing that. Do you still play some? I, I do. Yeah, I've always written um, all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, 
my favorite part of the music industry is uh, writing songs. That's that's always been my favorite part. Is right. uh, when you, especially that feeling when you just finished one, you go, okay, that one's done, and then you, and now you're you're ready to write another. And right. uh, so I've always done that. Always um, uh, have stayed um, uh, with it. Uh, not you know. So I've got probably, you know, a couple of hundred songs laying around right now. And, uh, and we, yeah, we are. So I've done a couple albums here and there over the years. And, um, but finally getting around to try to get everything cataloged and organized and at least a guitar vocal of, of all these songs that are out there and, and also songs that were released. And uh, I've just gone through a period of, getting um, several boxes of reel-to-reel tapes and two-inch tapes and uh, digitized so that I can, number one, what's on these tapes. And I found an album from 1974 that was never released uh, on, oh on my label. Called, it's called Manga Two Records is what it was. And it was a band called Joe Cool. And we released a single that sold, uh, we sold about 3,000 copies in the Denver area, had a lot of radio support. Well, let's talk about strings. Okay. We, we, all right. So tell me, uh, you know, tell me your, your philosophy of string making. Why um, the people that I talk to about your strings, because I've done a couple of phone calls from, from players and people that, and, um, you know, they absolutely positively love your strings, say they're cut above and, you know, all the, all the wonderful things that you would love to hear. Uh, obviously, Ted is, you know, one guy, but um, why? What what makes your string different? Why is it cool? And why is everybody saying all these great things about your strings? Well, first of all, guitar strings are going to be more alike than they are different because they have to be. It's a law of nature. OK, right. I mean, there's just certain things. However, there are things that you can do, um, which, you know, you're quarter wrap ratios, uh, the wire you're using, the tension on the core wire when you're winding the strings. There's just a lot of little variables that um, uh, that you have some control over. Right. And when we started the company, I had actually, uh, I mean, again, my, my, my job has had always been in the uh, sales and marketing area and not in the actual nuts and bolts of uh, making strings and how machines work and mm -hmm. that. So uh, after doing a lot of research, I, I found some people to build uh, machines for me that were custom. And um, I had hired a very knowledgeable person to come to Cortez and babysit us for about you know <laughs> six months and uh, teach us how to make strings. And um, about two weeks into this um, uh, endeavor, uh, my uh, person to help uh, had to take a job in the auto industry because it was just too much money. Couldn't turn it down. <laughs> so right. I'm sitting here with a building, strings, wire, and all this stuff. And uh, the person I had hired to uh, learn to become the production manager, uh, we just, I just said, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to make this stuff work. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny now, but at the time, no, I, like, no, I listen. I, I, I ran a business. I, I know. Uh, I ran a, a small, big business, or a big, small business, or whatever you want to call it. I, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. So, I think what made it, it, what made us a little different was that having having been a guitar player for all my life, and mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we just started with, we started experimenting and, uh, you know, when we got a 46 that we said, yeah, I, I like the way that sounds. I like the way it feels. And so we wrote down the recipe. Okay. This is what we're using on a 46, uh, nickel plated steel string. And I like the way it sounds. And I, and I was hoping to get, uh, you know, enough kind of enough meat on the core wire where it, when you get excited you don't get that kind of rubber band sound right but where you don't get so much meat on the core wire that you start to lose some of those lose some of those uh subtle high-end nuances that you know the, the twang factor i guess maybe, right where 
And so every string we ever built and, uh, was done by scratch. And uh, that's the way it is. So, and the other thing is that when we started and we still continue is every time we, we make small batches. You know, we make like 144 at a time. Now, we may make three or four gross of that at the same time. Mm -hmm. But every time we start a new gross, we, we take the first string and we take it over to a guitar and we actually you know, put it on the guitar, stretch it out, make sure that it intonates properly and make sure it's doing you know, what mm -hmm. it's supposed to do. So it's just a little bit there. And we've, we've all, over the years developed uh, lots of different checking. Um, uh, to you know, number one, make sure it's a hex core and not a round core, and uh, make sure that it you know it all specs out, and this is what we're, and that we're used in the right material. And then uh, we still do a lot of you know hand packaging, um, and in that process, uh, once the strings are checked by us, it also is checked by someone else to make, and they look for little things like back wines that maybe. Uh, we would miss. We try to catch everything in the production area. But, right. You know, sometimes you, you know, you'll miss it. And, and the nice thing about um, I developed a, a, a way of coiling the strings to put them in the envelopes where uh, it, 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 it's um, better for the, the packager and easier for the packager, but it also makes it to where you know, they'll feel a bump. They'll still feel a bump, they'll still see a bump. And, you know, so we do our best to try to make sure that, uh, you know, nothing gets out the door that isn't perfect is what right. we try to do. We're not, we're not perfect at it, but we right. should try to be. So um, what about like your sourcing of your, of your, you know, I mean, your spec of your alloy or your sourcing of your wire, your materials, is there anything that's in there that, is there anything in that that part of it that's special versus or not versus but and or um, the attention to detail? I mean, I'm hearing that you're paying a lot of attention to detail, and and there is a lot of detail. Like you said, there's you know there's the diameter of the core, there's uh, you know the tension of it, there's the you know you know uh, ratio of you know of the the outer material and the inner material, if you will, all those things. So I mean, is there something in there that that um, that you're looking at or well? We use nothing but USA made wire. And um, in the beginning, we actually uh, A and B quite a few wire companies and, and we found a wire company that we, we liked mm -hmm. that we thought um, on your um, tin plated high carbon steel uh, wire, which is for plane strings and four wires, uh, you know, it's kind of a, that wire is uh, very specialized. It's, um, and it has to be done exactly right or uh, it's either soft or it's brittle. And uh, you, you'd like it to be one step away from being brittle. That's right. where it's gonna be the strongest. So uh, yeah, that, that's one thing is making sure that that wire is exactly the way, because that's where your stability is. So your tin plate high carbon steel wire has got to be, uh, you, know, you really have to check it and uh, and make sure. Now, brittle is easy to find because if it's brittle, the machines won't run it. It will it will just break. That's simple. But uh, checking it for soft wire uh, is something we've got a little uh, system we use to make sure that it will break at a certain point and uh, things like that. Because if it's soft, it will just keep stretching and stretching and stretching and won't stand to. So, is there anything to you know, like um, string tension per gauge. In other words, like if I, if I put this string on a strat at 25 and a half inch, I know that, you know, bending it is going to be, you know, require that much pressure and energy. And you know what I'm saying? Um, oh, you know, yeah. 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 There's, there's definitely every gauge, um, every gauge. I mean, there's, there's tension calculators out there. We have one on our website and there's guides, you know, but you have to look at them as being, uh, they're more of a guide, but not a God right. by any means. Um, the, the real key is the player finding, you know, again, the, the gauge that fits how they play. Right. Um, 
you know, a 1046 set is the most common out, you know, 10, 13, 17, 26, 36, 46. Right. Um, and that's, that's, that string gauge actually happened when people started throwing away the 56 and they added a banjo tin to it. So uh, the old 1356 set, I mean, that's basically what happened. 56 went away and they put a tin on top. And I know the first time that I put that on a, um, a, a jazz master, uh, and thank God I locked the, uh, the tremolo on that when I did it. Uh, it took quite a while to get that uh, 1046 to actually kind of sound like something and not buzz. And, and to be honest, with the first 1046 that I put on the guitar after using 1356s and playing what we were playing, uh, it, yeah, it was easy to bend them. Yeah. But I just thought they sounded warm. I thought it was, uh, it took quite a while to figure out how, for me, it took a while to figure out, okay, how not to overplay it. Right. How not, you know, it, it was like a real adjustment. Of course, then once you did adjust, you know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's all good. But there's still something with, you put a, you know, if you put a 13 to 56 set on, on, a, <laughs> on a guitar and you start, I mean, it, there's a tone you get that uh, I mean you can't bend it, but uh, there's a tone you get that that's pretty amazing. I think Pete Townsend said that he can't he can't play his stage guitars at home because he's got them strung up. I think I think it is thirteen through fifty six, and um and but at home when he's on stage he's got so much adrenaline that he he said they bend like you know like like spaghetti. He said but at home they're so tight he can't he can't bend them at all. So it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, it's it's fun. I I came along in the in the same era, you know, and um, you know, tens were considered to be. I guess that was that the slinky and the and super slinky was uh, nines, I guess, from Ernie Ball. Right, and, exactly. And yeah. all of that, and um, I mean, I remember when we started putting tens on a guitar. That was like, wow, what is this? And and, and I, I do remember that time. I mean, I, I was around at the, at the same time, and it's it's people. And today, you know, I mean, I well, most of my guitars have got. Electric guitars, most of them have tens. Uh, some have actually have do have nines on them, and uh, the jazz boxes have elevens and twelves. This this guitar right. here, this guitar here has got twelves. Um, there's another one over there that's got, well, no, that's that's I think twelves, but this one's had elevens on it, and the, the telly's got nines, and you know it's just it's it's amazing. Um, guitars come a long way since you and I first got started. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean the thing of and strings have come along yeah. since then too. I mean, um, I think the greatest state today is the uh, is all the options that a player does have. Right. Um, you know, like I say, it's ten forty six. That's you know that's hands down the most popular gauge still for most players. Right. But you know, uh, you know we we do a thing on our website where you can actually build your own sets, your own labels. Right. And you can pick the gauges you want, um, and you can put your name on the labels, and you can put your. You can actually upload a uh, a picture. It, it's it's a pretty elaborate um, program. It took us almost a, a year and a half to get everything to work, and but it, it's it's really pretty amazing what you're able to do it. And some of the some of the the labels that uh, that come across are just, I mean they it, they're really really very cool i mean it's really they spent their time but you know you might have a player that that rather than a 10 13 17 if they'll go with uh you know 15 or a, or a 16 depending on what they're playing i mean it's right. uh you know i have to admit that if, if you're doing like a honky tonk woman band you know on the second fret with a 17 um it's a lot easier to do it with a 16 at, at that position now as you go up the neck the 17 is easy to push around but you know closer to the nut it's, it's quite a bit harder to do. So if you put a 16 there, you know, it makes it, I, again, depending on what you're, what type right. of music you're playing and what song you're playing. <laughs> so you, you have a, you have a, a full, you know, a full catalog. I mean, nickel plated hex core, pure nickel sets, flat wound, 12 string sets, nickel plated steel coated, pure nickel vintage round core, drop tuning. Nickel. So the gauges, the gauges, obviously, um, you know, 10 through 46 is your most popular. Is there, is there a most popular set? I mean, is the nickel set more popular than the, um, you know, vintage round core? I mean, Nick, there... nickel plated steel is still the most, um, Pop album, right. and um, 
hex cores is still the most popular as well. I mean, hex, there's no right or wrong between hex and uh, ground core between pure nickel, nickel plated steel, monel, stainless, you know, uh, each one of the alloys and each one of the core wires, they, they have a, a, you know, difference in tone, feel, right. and, uh, and then again, whatever application you're using. So people that don't know, what is the fundamental difference between the hex core and the round core? I mean, what, well, what, every, what... everything ahead. was round core up till, uh, you know, the, probably the mid seventies is when everybody, most people at that point switched over to hex core. Um, what we have to do when we're making a round core string is uh, we have to actually uh, swedge uh, the core wire. And we have to, well, what we're doing is that we're, we're flattening it where it creates uh, four sharp edges on the, uh, the wire. Mm -hmm. And, and then as, and that's, and that is on the core wire right before the end of the actual wrap on the string. Mm -hmm. And that little section that gives the cover wire something to hang on to so it doesn't come unraveled. Right. And uh, now in the older days, um, most people would just go ahead and, uh, you know, if your guitar had a uh, eye in the tuning post, uh, you know, they still, they would just put it in there, string it up, wrap it up, get everything in tune. And once it's in tune, that's when they would uh, cut off the excess wire. Right. And by that, by that point, everything's uh, all secure and it's not going to come unravel. Uh, the, the challenge, and I can remember when uh, I would change strings, I was taught uh, to make sure that on, you know, fenders with uh, slotted uh, tuning posts, that uh, you would want to bend that wire, uh, make a 90 degree bend on that wire, uh, you know, a, a couple inches past the post you're going to put it into, cut it, get it in there, get it tuned up quick so that it would go ahead and keep everything uh, secure. Uh, the, the problem with, uh, with round core was in the, in the application, making sure that you did those things correctly. Because if you cut it off before you put it in, that string unravels and that string is uh, not going to work. You know, and when, you, when you're a kid buying your strings with uh, with money that you uh, you know, collected pop bottles for, it's a if you lose the string, you're you just you feel real bad because you got to go collect a lot more pop bottles and mow a lot more lawns and all that to get the money for a new set yeah. of strings. I mean, they were they were a lot less expensive, but the dollar went a lot further. Back exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, but yeah. I, I don't want to keep I don't want to keep you too long. I just wanted to kind of touch base with you. Um, what would you like people to know about about your company? What would you like, you know, uh, people that are going to see this? Uh, what would well, you like? Well, I, I like think to tell I them? think the big I think the basic thing is is that you know we're a small company, mm -hmm. uh, we're very hands on, you know it's it's not a <laughs> it's definitely not a corporate uh, uh, environment of any sort. It's it's a family owned business, you know. Uh -huh. I got my grandson running around for, you know, most of the day. Um, but, you know, everybody stays busy. They do their best to try to make the best products. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, we've always been about, you know, no smoke and mirrors. Uh, yeah. This is what we do. Uh, we'll tell you the truth about what we do and, uh, you know, and we'll take care of it. Well, I got to tell you, um, I, I've heard nothing but good stuff about you and your company. And um, yeah, and and from people who I respect and admire. And uh, I just felt it was, you know, just a, a cool thing to do to actually talk to you today. And I'm, I'm glad we did. As I say, when I do these things that, you know, there's a lot of guys I've talked to, you know, two, three, four times, you know, artists and, and manufacturers and all that about their products. So hopefully this is the beginning of a relationship and we'll we'll be able to have a few more chats as we get down the road That'd be um, great. and anyway anyway um so hang with me but this is bob baker and kurt Mangus just saying goodbye um and we we appreciate you all and if you like the material that we're putting out please like share follow all those kinds of subscribe and um so thank you very much